Welcome back gang, it's Delta from DeltiasGaming.com and in this video we're covering the Stamina Nightblade. How to play all three builds, group, solo, and noob or beginner. So if you're looking for more information on Stamina Nightblade, not only just ganking but actually playing toe to toe with other enemies, this video is for you. So let's get started. Should you play this build, why or why not? positive of this build is you hit extremely hard both single target and AoE. You can play open field Imperial City or dueling and have success, and you don't rely on heavy armor in the typical sets most people are using. The downside, it requires a lot of skill to actually nuke a player, get out and survive, and you don't have the powerful healing that other classes do. So if you're looking at playing this build, just keep those things in mind. Alright, so the Spectre is back. Um, similar to what we used to run, but I've been playing this thing non-stop since you guys voted the other day on it. And so we're going to cover a lot, a lot, a lot of things in detail. So if you don't like detailed videos, this ain't for you. First thing you need to understand about uh, Stamina Nightblades and really is stealth and invisibility. The difference between the two. That's really going to set up what we use as skills. So let me show you a couple different things. One is stealth. Stealth is different than invisibility. We get invisibility through our cloak, dark cloak or shadowy disguise, whatever you use. So players can't see you while you're in it. Makes sense, right? Same thing with stealth. Every class can do stealth, not just the night blades. But night blades get a bigger advantage from using stealth and or invisibility due to the master assassin passive. Certain races get additional benefit as well. You stun longer. Now, two things to know. Stealth, you can do a fully charged heavy attack and stun a player. So do to do. Now it's obviously it's an NPC, but you see how it did 30,000 damage there? 30,000 when we attack from stealth. I got detected and it only did about seven. So let me show you this again. This will make sense in a second. Right there, 42,000 surprise attack. Now if I just go in invisibility, hit him, 16.9. So there's a big difference between that. That's the reason I'm explaining this to you is when you start off with your opener, you get a huge advantage from being in stealth like this versus just doing a cloak and attacking. So keep that in mind. So this is the build I use for solo uh, primarily first, and we're going to cover that. I have a bunch of different loadouts I use, uh, as you can see here. Since everyone can do solo, it makes sense to kind of go over this first and um, basically you got to have a gap closer. The nice thing about this gap closer is it empowers your next attack, though it's not always ideal for ganking. Ganking, you want an empower, but you don't want to have to use your uh, attack out of stealth to get it. So for true ganking, what you're going to want to do is use Radiant Mage Light. It doesn't seem like it makes sense. Gives you Major Prophecy. Okay, Spell Crit doesn't make sense. Reduces stealth attacks. That's good. Attacks people from stealth. That's good. But really, it comes from the Might of the Guild passive here. And the nice thing is you don't have to attack or come out of stealth or invisibility and waste your big burst to use it. So I don't primarily gank. I usually jump on players and nuke them. So that's why I use ambush here. So ambush is your gap closer, gives you an empower, but you got to set it up against good players. So that's all what you're going to do is start with this typically, unless you're in stealth to start. Next ability up comes from the shadow skill line, Mass Hysteria. Probably the best stun in the game. Um, it stuns three enemies, causing them to flee in terror, reducing their movement speed, and reducing their damage done for four seconds. And CC breaking or break free has a six second cooldown. So you're going to want to keep target stunned every six seconds. And when I say stunned, it's basically the little circle at their feet. It's a common misconception that not a lot of players understand. And it's really the separates you from being extremely good at PvP and being mediocre. Is you see those secret, those circles there? It means when I do mass hysteria, nothing happens. As soon as the circles are gone, I can stun the opponent again. Obviously, this is PvE. The reason you're going to want to focus on stunning is because that's when their, their block can't be up, they can't dodge, they can't avoid all your damage. So really, you're trying to time all your bursts around, boom, they're stunned, then you nuke them down. Not before, because if you do it before... Well, they can dodge, they can heal, they can block, they can avoid all the damage. So, boom, see? Understand fear is your primary setup tool before your big burst phase. Shadowy Disguise gives us a guaranteed crit, and that's why I use the Shadow Munda Stone. So, within your next attack, within three seconds. So, even while you're stealth, you can hit this, 
and also give yourself a guaranteed crit coming out of stealth. So if we wanted to get really nasty and we wanted to gank, which I don't usually do, but sometimes it's fun just to nuke people, what you're going to do is you're going to hit your Radiant Mage Light and your Shadowy Disguise coming up on the player. It's going to give you guaranteed crit and 20% more damage. So right there, 50,000 surprise attack. Now that was from stealth though. Pretty much most players can't deal with that uh, one attack and then you just do a end cap and finish them off and you can pretty much two shot most players if they're not aware. Kind of cheesy but yeah that's what the Nightblade excels at. Okay and our primary spammable attack is surprise attack. Just an incredible ability. It's really up close so we're going to play melee we're not going to play the bow ganker in the back. Does damage but it really gives us the physical resistance, penetration, uh, it gives us a major fracture. So 5,000 physical resistance debuff for 17.3 seconds. The debuff can be cleansed, but combine this with our Spriggan set, you're going to make those heavy armor users really feel like they're in light because you're just going to debuff their, their armor so much. Another undervalued thing that this skill does here in Surprise Attack is it gives us da -da -da, major ward and major resistance. So it gives us our major resistances just for using our primary spammable attack, making us more tanky. It's extraordinarily powerful. And you have one of two options here that I like to use for solo play. Typically, I use Steel Tornado. And the reason I use Steel Tornado is if I'm Zerg surfing and I, I just want to nuke down a bunch of groups when other people push in, I'll spam Steel Tornado. If I'm going for a pure single target killer, you go with Killer's Blade. Killer's Blade doesn't have a whole lot of range, but the nice thing about it is it gives you that nice heal if you kill a target within two seconds, and it hits pretty hard. Also, the disease damage is useful as well. Though, Steel Tornado has a lot of uses as well, besides just AoE cleaving. So, you're going to encounter Sorks that are going to sit in Daedric Mines, and it's going to be hard to deal with that. You can use Steel Tornado here to put pressure on them, just because the, the radius is 9 meters. Look how long that is. So it's still a really good ability, plus when they're out of range of your surprise attack, that 5 meters, this 9 meters will hit them. And it does a lot more damage the lower health they are. So sometimes if I can't reach them, I'll continue to put pressure on them or do a gap closer. Either way, Steel Tornado is a really good ability. Now, Incapacitating Strike, uh, you got two morph options that are really useful. Incapacitating Strike is on disease damage, which gets bumped up in our champion points, so it hits harder. Soul Harvest is a magic based, but it gives us ultimate back when we kill mobs. So there's a couple combos you can do, so let's focus on Incapacitating Strike first. Incap, it's almost like a zero counterplay skill. It's pretty cheesy because it hits just so hard. I mean, you combine that with a surprise attack from stealth and an incap almost simultaneously, it's basically like zero counterplay. You really can't, I mean, counter it almost, which it shouldn't be in the MMO, but it is. Give this major D file, which reduces the healing and increasing your damage against the target by 20% for six seconds and only costs 50 ultimate. So this thing is just constantly up, especially if we're using potions a lot of times. After drinking a potion, you gain 20 ultimate. So you're pretty much using this almost as a different attack. Though, when you're using NCAP, you need to set it up first. So when I say set it up, against skilled players, they're going to be able to counter NCAP. They're going to know what a Nightblades wants to do. So you'll see beginner Nightblades basically ambush in and do NCAP right away. That's not the appropriate way to do it if you want the biggest results. The best way to use end cap is really to jump in with your ambush or if you're in stealth, just kind of hit someone with a surprise attack first. But really, you want to jump in mass hysteria first. Why? Well, because it drops their block. It gives you that split second, even against a really skilled player, where they have basically no counterplay to it. So you jump in, mass hysteria, get their block down, boom then end gap them. You want to get the most bang for your buck. And if you end cap when their block is dropped, they can't counter it. It's the best bet. Otherwise, you're going to jump in there. They're going to dodge. They're going to hold block and your end cap isn't going to hit very hard. Yes, end cap does also give a stun, but really the proper way to use it is stun them right before. A combo you can do if you're not in stealth is shadowy disguise and then surprise attack. So the thing is, attacking with surprise attack by stealth or invisible stuns the targets. So it's invisible too. So if we're just invisible, a fully charged heavy attack, good way to start a fight, but it won't stun them. Invisible, surprise attack, will stun them. Also, you see that circle above their head? That means you can do a heavy attack and stun them, and also it means they're going to take 10% more damage via our champion points. 
So the optimal way I like to start fights, in stealth. If I'm in stealth, I do a fully charged heavy attack. So I cloak first, fully charged heavy attack, surprise attack. And usually they die before that even happens. So surprise attack, then in or an end cap. If I'm not in stealth and I'm just going to cloak up to them, then I do surprise attack first. So really it's just to stun them, however you can do that. And then if they're not stunnable, then I fear them once they can be and nuke them down. Okay, so it takes a lot of practice to get good at this. I'm not perfect, nor am I the best Nightblade. But realize you want to set up your big burst around when an opponent can be uh, stunned. That's going to give you the best bang for your buck in nuking opponent. I'm going to get to gear in a minute, but I'm using the same lean set. I don't have well fitted, but uh, infuse works for now. Essentially what that does is direct melee damage. So surprise attack, sometimes ambush, deadly cloak will proc this. It will summon a huge bear that will just absolutely obliterate an opponent. And an advanced tip for you is when you hear the bear to mass hysteria. So like if we just show you what this looks like. I don't know why I'm saying we. Come on, bear. See that bear? Once you actually hear and see that green glow, it's going to take about one to two seconds for it actually to uh, do its effect. So that's an opportune time to use fear. That way, the bear lands at that exact same time. So you can do the fear and an end cap when the bear comes out, and it's basically zero counterplay. So that's kind of how you set it up. As soon as you hear and or see the bear, you're going to immediately do mass hysteria. Now, the thing about mass hysteria is the animation is long-winded. One, 1,000. So you can block cancel it. So as soon as you see the bear, basically what you do is click the button that mass hysteria does, and then you block. See? It goes so much faster, which allows you to do another end cap. So it's bear. Really slow would be you hear or see the bear. Mass hysteria, block, and then you do an end cap. So I'll kind of show it to you fast here. So block cancel mass hysteria, end cap, and I block cancel end cap as well since it's a long animation. So it takes a lot of practice to get really good at it. But if you can manage to focus your burst around the bear and CC, there's almost zero counterplay and you can nuke a player. It's going to take you a very long time to get that down considering that I'm no master at it as well but it's almost uncounterable if you do it right. Our back bar here is mainly just buffs with a lot of flexible things that you can use depending on your play style. So Relentless Focus is a no-brainer. Gives us stamina recovery and 8% more damage done. Plus it gives us the ranged ability after doing light and or heavy attacks. It's just incredible. You gotta keep it up at all times. The reason I use two hand or not a bow on my back, well, I like the uh, melee up close and personal, but rally is that burst, burst, burst heal. Really need this as a knife blade since we don't have major mending or minor. So uh, getting this rally off appropriately will really save your life because resolving vigor, while it is a strong heal, but it heals over time. So you might have a couple ticks on it, but if you need that big burst heal, you gotta focus on rally. It also gives us our major buff as well. Trick with rally is if you cast it simultaneously back to back, it's not that powerful of a heal. If you let it go for a long time, it becomes a powerful heal. So let it go for a while, and then when you need a big burst heal, boom, pop it again. Refresh the buff. Rally is the way to go. The other ability we use defensively is Shuffle. Uh, you're going to use this over the Assassin's ability Blur, and the reason why is it gets you out of trouble. Each piece of medium armor worn grants you immunity to snares and immobilizations. So when you're getting snared, you're trying to like nuke someone down, let's say you're successful, everyone's gonna turn to you and try to kill you. How you get out is shuffle. Really, it's shuffle and rally, these two things. So here's how we use it. We go into our CP, and I'll show you this in a second, unchained. Reduces stamina cost of abilities by 80% for three seconds after breaking uh, free, knockdown, fear, disorient, stagger. So you're going to nuke a player with what I showed you earlier. Nine times out of ten, people are going to try to chase you down. The very first thing they're going to do to you is stun you. Now, that's not actually a big deal for us. But what we're going to do to counter that and to get out is we're going to cast our rally right away to give us that big burst heal. Secondly, we're going to cast shuffle within that three seconds. So it's going to give us about four seconds where we can just zoom away and we can't be snared or immobilized. You have to use it within the three second unchained window. Otherwise, it's going to drain your stamina. So I know it's an NPC, but if we go in here, do do do. 
We nuke you. Now our friends come. What we do is let's say we get stunned. Boom. Rally. Snared. And I get out. Now we don't have major expeditions since we're on our, we don't have a bow and we can't use the dodge roll, but we can use potions for it as well. So potions, you're just as fast as you would be with the bow and you don't have to use one. Siphoning attacks, this is a flexible spot. If you're going to go full on ganker and just like go in there and try to nuke one target, you really want radiant mage light on your backlar. So that way you can uh, get... Well, you can basically defend against other gankers like yourself, but then you can get that empowered before you nuke someone down. Siphoning attacks is okay. It's kind of a flex spot that I use because you have to really weave in and out attacks a lot. And if you're just kind of coming in and bursting in, it's not that effective. Some other skills that you can use is piercing mark. It's going to really uh, suck the life out of other night blades. I mean, the worst the worst thing a night blade can go against is one of two things: another night blade using this, or a templar using soul assault. Those two things will really give us a hard problem. You can use this because night blades can't go in stealth with this. It really sucks when this gets on you. You can also use shade here too if you're really struggling, like jumping in and bursting someone down and dying. Uh, basically, it lets you teleport back. The way you'd be using Shade is, let's say you're in stealth, you cast it. It puts this little guy right here, okay? Now, the range isn't super long, but it allows you kind of just for a few seconds to kind of go around, get loosey-goosey, nuke a player. Uh-oh, 30 people are on me. I go back to my Shade. I get in stealth. I cloak. I use the major expedition pot. I'm out of there. Resolving Vigor, we talked about earlier, it's a heal, but it's over time. So it's going to be kind of one of those things where you can use it in conjunction in conjunction with Rally, your burst heal, heal over time to survive. The essence of Nightblade, Stam Nightblade, is not healing through damage like a Templar, where you're just sitting there blocking, you're using your ritual, your breath of lifing. It's really to avoid damage. So having Shuffle Up for your dodge chance, dodge rolling a lot to avoid them big attacks, and then using Rally and Vigor secondarily for healing. Speaking of healing, if I am in an O Panic mode and six people are chasing me, uh, I have this on my back bar. I'm not going to use this primarily, but what it does is gives a massive amount of burst damage, though it is magic based. So it's not going to hit as hard as some of the stamina abilities like Dawnbreaker, though it gives us a nice bit of healing. So if four or five people are chasing me, boom, I pop this, uh, it gives me a lot of healing, and then I try to escape with it. If you're a vampire, another really successful way to play is Devouring Swarm or Clouding Swarm. Clouding doesn't give you the healing, but it lets you go uh, and escape. So Clouding, the other morph of this, will turn you invisible. You can hit that, run away, and then use your Dark Cloak to gain some space as well. Some flex options um, that I like to do if I'm facing against like a lot of other players and I'm, I'm Zerg surfing, I use Dawnbreaker or Smiting from NCAP. NCAP single target, utterly insane, but it's not AoE. Dawnbreaker or Smiting hits almost as hard and it has a dot attached with it as well, though it doesn't have a healing debuff and it doesn't have the 20% damage increase. But 120 cost, a huge conal in front of you so if you're facing against a lot of players dawnbreaker smiting is going to benefit you more than ncap well that's the solo build skills now let's talk about the gear i've been using eternal hunt for basically eons ever since it came out and i i just can't get away solo without it it's just because that rune is so explosive there's a lot of different ways to use the rune as well you can use it offensively. So a lot of people, when you jump in with an ambush, they'll automatically S key or backpedal. They'll just do this. So like a, a funny little trick against newer players that you can use is basically you ambush in, you dodge roll through them and turn around. The rune itself will actually proc the salines as well. See, you dodge roll through them. These are obviously NPCs, but they're, they're almost guaranteed to turn around into it. And it hits extremely hard, provides an immobilization. So, if you're trying to go against a player and confuse them, you ambush in, dodge roll, turn on them. If the same lean procs because of your rune, mass hysteria, they will get nuked. The nice thing about it is also, this is kind of like your recovery escapable set. I like to solo, I like to have one recovery or survivability set, then I like to have one DPS set. So I recommend if you can get the traits, five impenetrable, two well fitted. That seems to be the best for me. Next up, oh my gosh, Spriggans cost a immense amount of gold. Ridiculous amount of gold. I was wondering if it was worth it. 
Yeah, it's worth it. The physical penetration on a stamp build is staggering, though getting these swords is utterly, insanely difficult farming-wise, or it's just going to cost you a ton of gold. So, I went with the ton of gold route, and I love this set. Tons of max stam, which helps our healing, weapon damage for the four-piece, and then almost an almost 4k physical penetration here. Add that with the sharp and we're sitting at 9k. You get a crusher enchant here and we're doing heavy attack and we're not using poisons, there's another 1600. So you can really debuff those enemies. Swords more than daggers, reason why? Well, we already have a guaranteed crit. So we want the weapon damage that the passive in dual wield provides. So you see here, swords increase your damage done by 2.5%. Excuse me, not weapon damage, just a flat damage increase. Axes is also good if we're going to do heavy attacks. Uh, maces might be bugs, so I don't know if it's worth it. And you might not want to go fully into physical resistance because if you're going against a light armor player, you might completely debuff them and then there's no advantage going beyond the resistance. Other games, you know, let's say someone has 10,000 resistance and you have 15,000 penetration, you would get a damage multiplier for going over that. Not this game. So it doesn't make sense to go into that. Monster Helm, Salines. Um, it's... It's really, really tricky to make this work for you, but if you do, it's almost uncounterable. The downside is it's direct melee damage. It's not all damage. So uh, it has a 15% proc chance. Sometimes it's a really, really low proc chance if you're not light attack weaving. If you are, and you can use the mass hysteria to your advantage, it's the way to go. If you're not seeing the value in this proc set, Belladreth is another option here. Just because it's any damage, it's 20%, and it's three spores. Though, if you get good at the Saline's trick, it's almost uncounterable for one single player. Ironically, if you have a Maelstrom, Maul, Sword, whatever, and it's powered, there's actually a decent trait for this, since we're not really using this for damage. We're just using this for healing. So, power, even precise, will affect uh, your healing values. So, something like that. You don't have Maelstrom, that's fine. Just use a crafted one. Uh, I would go with Powered, which seems odd, but you're going to get a lot more healing from Rally, especially with Battle Spirit. Okay, so that's the first build, the Spectre Solo. Now I'm going to talk about the Spectre Group. So the Spectre group play is all about AoE bursts. When I say group, I'm assuming you have about four to six people and or more. And you have a dedicated healer. So what you're going to do is focus more so on AOE, less single target, and a lot less sustained. So you're going to go all out ham on your damage. Assuming you have a Templar that's using Repentance and it's using Spear Shards. That way you really don't have to have any stamina and you still can secede. You can also run stamina based sets with my green orbs here, which I'm going to get to in a little bit. Or Hunding's Rage, even Clever Alchemist to have unimaginable burst. Though, it's tricky to use. So, a couple things I swap in and out. Um, Mass Hysteria, really, really good, but it is a magic train. So, if I have a magic night blade or I have someone else that can drop block, like let's say a Sork Streaking, a Templar Samming uh, Luminous Spears, I use Deadly Cloak. Reason why I use Deadly Cloak? Well, gives us a lot of damage. You can use uh, the other more for speed if you're not using movable speed potions, but it reduces our AoE damage by 20%. So those annoying Destro alts, 20% less damage. Those annoying Steel Tornadoes and Dawnbreakers, 20% less damage. Plus it does a lot of damage in and of itself and lasts a long time. So it allows us to kind of jump in the mix without getting shredded instantly. Still use Shadowy Disguise because usually the way I play this is I let the main non-cloakable, non-stealth classes kind of go up to the enemies like here on the tree. You got to play as a Nightblade. So you're not going to just going to run out of stealth and go, hey, I'm going to come bomb you. The way you're going to play this here is, is this is a troll. Your team's right here. You need to get in stealth or invisibility and come from the flank. The way to set it up is have the Nightblade jump in first with a Dawnbreaker to knock the opponents down. And then you come in with your other group, flank Destro alts and level them. So you're kind of the primary uh Primary fight starter with your Dawnbreaker of Smiting. Attack bar changes, really. I drop siphoning attacks for retreat maneuvers. Why? It grants immunity to snares and mobilizations and allows everyone to move really, really fast. So it allows us to get out of dodge when we're in trouble. Downside is if you attack or heal, you lose the advantage of the movement speed. So the same thing applies with Shuffle that we use the Unchained passive for here. 
right here, Unchained, 80% reduced cost. Because if you look at the cost of this sucker, what is it at? 6,000. So 80% less 6,000, well, it's really easy. So every time I get stunned, almost every single time I cast this because it's just almost a free ability. If you have someone else running your retreating maneuvers, you should run Razor Caltrops instead. Use it the exact same way. I usually I throw Razor Caltrops and then use a potion to just kind of fill up on stamina, or I wait till I get CC'd, then throw it to cover our retreat. Either way, this is a group utility slot here. I use Devouring Swarm as basically a way that I pop it on my back bar, bar swap, jump in. So if I'm just going to take an extreme amount of damage, there's Destralts everywhere, you'll, you'll just get nuked as a vampire unless you have this. I tried Clouding Swarm, and the reason I was going to use Clouding Swarm is because of the stealthy passive, increase your damage done while in stealth by 10%, along with the Master Assassination passive. Increase your damage done by invisibility or stealth by 10%. It didn't seem to work on my racial passive. So I was going to do Clouding Swarm, Steel Tornado, basically uncounterable. Was not effective. So that's why I went with Devouring. I can jump in there. I cannot die instantly uh, and be able to just spin Steel Tornado for a few seconds. Um, if you want to go really vampire heavy and you're going to use the Devouring Swarm primarily over Dawnbreaker... You're going to switch Incapacitating Strike Morph. You're going to switch it to Soul Harvest because you get ultimate back based on how many kills you get. So what you do is you pop bats, you go to your Steel Tornado, you kill a bunch of stuff, Deadly Cloaks up, and your Soul Harvest is just giving you tons and tons of ultimate. Why? Well, it stacks with Combat Frenzy. It stacks with our Potion Passive. So basically, you can keep up bats all the time as long as you're killing stuff and you have Soul Harvest over end cap over here. But typically, I like Dawnbreaker of Smiting for the stun, and I like end cap because I do play solo quite a bit. Gear changes, uh, Velodreth is an obvious choice. Why? Well, it's just AoE. It has an easier chance to proc, and it's just going to do a lot more damage uh, to more targets. You have some interesting choices uh, as far as gear goes for group stamina-based DPS. There's basically three choices that I think are the best. One, Powerful Assault. So Powerful Assault hits up to four friendly targets, 10 meters, gives us a little bit of damage. It's going to do more damage than Internal Hunt, but it gives us a little bit boost to the group play, which I like. The other thing is her scenes. I have really bad traits on here, but they fix the two in the four piece. So essentially, if we look at her Eternal Hunt, it gives us basically the exact same thing Eternal Hunt does, except the five piece increases your standard recovery, but you and the group by 10%. It's a huge radius as well. It affects up to 12 people. So it's really handy if you're running a larger group. Thing that you would run and i don't have it on me is night mother's gaze so let me see this is a add-on called inventory insight it lets you sort through all your characters so if we go to night mother's gaze here when you crit damage you reduce the enemy's physical resistance by 2500 that equates to i think roughly around eight percent damage increase for you and your party so uh, if you have other stamina builds I would primarily run Night Mother's Gaze, damage producing number one. Number two, I would run Powerful Assault if no one else has it. Number three, I'd run Her Scenes for just uh, some group utility. So those are the group adaptations. Let's talk about what I use for beginner or solo play when you're new or have a no CP campaign. So what we're going to do for the beginner build is switch to uh, a two-hander and a bow primarily, just because it's a lot simpler. So the gear, we're going to go with a little bit more regen, a lot less damage. Simply, Hunting's Rage still works really well. Five in pin, two well-footed if you can. It gives us a good source of damage. It gives us max stamina. It's easily to craft. The second thing you're going to want to do is have a three-piece, including your weapons and like a head and shoulder. So Mark Holden, I already have this crafted, but you can use Night Silence as well, which would be basically the same set bonuses. One max stam, one stam recovery. Another thing you can do is get really cheap jewelry of endurance, which is going to give you a nice health bonus and give you stam recovery. So we're just going to have a ton and ton of stam recovery. This is ideal for people that are trying to learn this build and maybe don't have any CP or really Really low CP because ultimately if you can kill one person that doesn't really matter what you want to do is kill you know 10 people 
for every time you die. When I say kill someone, I'm talking about killing blows. So if you go in there and you die because you have no stamina and you can't survive, it's really not a good build. So you need to find that threshold where your stam recovery is good enough so you can survive, doing a few heavy attacks here and there, potions, and that you're killing players, but you're not just getting overwhelmed and dying every time you do. But in terms of skills, what we're gonna do is pretty simple. We're gonna do a two-hander, still like my gap closer ambush, we're going to keep Rally on our main uh, damage ability bar. Reason being, it's easy to just activate a heal real quick. And then Mass Hysteria here as our main primary stun with Cloak on our back bar. Surprise Stack as our main spammable. Reverse Slices that execute. The reason why it scales better um, and it also does AoE damage. So you're going to have some AoE damage even while you're single targeting. End Cap for a stun. And it's just a, basically the simpler version of the two. Back here in our bow, we're going to have Shadowy Disguise and our Heal Vigor with Poison Injection. So Poison Injection is nice because you can do damage before you jump in. You can build ultimate and you can pretty much kill players at a super long range. So you don't have to go full aggressive melee. Also, you can escape and use different potions since you're going to have major expedition after you do a dodge roll. So you don't have to use super expensive potions. So ideally what you're going to do is you're going to target a single player, whatever that may be. You're going to hit them with the Poison Injection Cloak. Come up, fully charge heavy, or a surprise attack, and nuke them that way. You're not going to have near the burst, but you can survive a lot longer. And that's what it's going to take to kind of learn the build. So I can still hit for about 15k uh, in PvE surprise attacks, which isn't bad. But the dual world is going to give you that extra advantage and set bonuses. This is going to give you an awesome amount of regeneration, though. Especially when you kill these little critters. We come in here to our weapons two-hander. 30% stamina recovery for 10 seconds after killing a mob. So we bumped up to about 3,000. Uh, that's still with the Shadow Munda Stone stamina recovery. And then if we use a potion on top of that as well, we have a lot of stamina recovery. It's just a lot more forgiving than uh, running the dual wield with food. So champion points here, we go with 65 into Warlord for a decent amount of reduced cost. 65 into Mooncalf, and I put a lot into Tumbling, so CC Breaking and Dodge Rolling. That's our main, basically, survivability besides healing, is just being elusive. So I really like this. I don't know if there's a diminishing return with Tumbling, but I see I have plenty of survivability using it a lot. Over here, if you're going to use Clouding Swarm or uh, Devouring Swarm as an ultimate, or even Dawnbreaker or Smiting, splash a little bit points into Thaumaturge. Otherwise, they do a lot into Precise Strikes, Piercing, and then 100 into Mighty. Like 20 into Critical Resistance, 75, 75, 7, and then a little bit of Quick Recovery. And that's basically it. Something really undervalued is Consumables. And so we're going to talk what I use for each specific build. So for group focus play, I like to use either buy stat or try stat food. So I don't have any regen. Mainly I'm focused on my Templars using Repentance and Spear Shards for stamina sustain. And so I go all out DPS. Remember more max stamina, more we weapon damage, the more damage you do. Solo play, I like to use this food when I'm not a vampire. Health recovery actually does do a little bit for me, but it's really the stamina and magic recovery that allows me to cloak a lot more, do some more dodge rolls, and cast my skills. Since I'm a magic uh, Nightblade, a lot of our abilities are magic based, and it seems like the extra magic recovery that this gives me is good. However, you're going to lose some damage with it since it don't have the max stamina component with it, but it's very, very useful. For the beginner build or no CP, if you really want a lot of stamina sustained, I go with this food here. Max health and tons of stamina recovery. Though you don't have the max stamina, so you will lose damage. But you got to survive first, kill later. Once you learn how to survive, then you kind of step up your DPS. So if you're learning the, the new player build and you're doing really good, get off of this training wheel food and go to the big boy food. Once you can figure out how to sustain on this, you're going to kill a lot more players, but you got to start out with surviving. Poison, there's a myriad of poisons that are really, really useful. So I think the best right now, as my friend Malady told me about, is Escapist. It acts as a movability potion, essentially, and drains stamina from your target. So it's really, really nice for group play when I'm doing still tornadoes that'll proc it. 
Um, solo play or dueling, if you want to use these, uh, people think they're cheap, but they're really effective. Does poison damage and drains resources from your opponents. So single target purely, it's really going to be helpful killing them block plars that are just infinitely blocking and breath of life spamming. But you got to make sure you're light, heavy attack weaving in between your abilities to get this thing to proc. Pure damage, damage health poisons, especially if you're using the beginner build and you want to put it on your bow using a poison injection before you charge in. Because remember, you can have different poisons on different bars. Potions, lots to choose from here. Uh, I use this when I'm playing in group play just so I can escape and get a forward camp up. Primarily, I use this. They're expensive, but they're really worthwhile. Immune to CC, Major Expedition, and Stamina Recovery because it's going to give you that speed for 47 seconds, which is nice since we don't use a bow. For beginner builds, if you have a lot of stamina recovery, you can run Essence of Lingering Health just for a nice amount of healing and a boost to your self-healing. It's really uh, beneficial for survival. I just recommended Khajiit. My friend Chori brought up some reasons behind why the Wood Elf is better. And yeah, I bit the bullet and spent some money changing it. And so basically what you get is about 11% more stamina recovery than a Khajiit. Okay, that's good. You get 6% more stamina and resistance, which the Khajiit does not have. The Khajiit does have health recovery, which is nice if you're not a vampire, but it doesn't have max stamina. Stamina, max stamina is useful for healing, which is the Nightblade really, really needs. Khajiit's benefit is the crit, which is really more beneficial for PvE, considering we have a guaranteed crit with our surprise attack or with our shadowy disguise surprise attack combo so you the melee uh crit doesn't really see the weapon crit you don't really see the bonus that you would in pve versus pvp the big one is stealthy the same thing the khajiit the khajiit gets but we get it as a wood elf as well so you get more sustain more max stats and the same burst in us that you would as a khajiit but I really, really like this just for survivability. You can also go with the Red Guard as well. But if you want to play the stealthy rogue type thing, you got to have this passive. So I really recommend Wood Elf or Khajiit. Something that also would be fun is an Orc since they have a lot of speed and they have health, health, re healing, receive. They're really just a tanky race. But my number one racial choice now for PvP would be Wood Elf. So lastly, I got to do some shout outs and some thank yous. A lot of people have been helping me recently with gold, sending me mats, potions, uh, just a lot of different things. And I'm not going to beg for materials, but the reason it's helpful sending that stuff to me on PC, uh, NA, at Delta, if you want to give me donations, is number one, I don't have to spend the time farming the materials myself. The reason I like to make my gear gold is to see what the highest level uh, stuff that you can get what you can expect at the very max level so that's why it's super useful for me gold i can just buy outright the spriggan swords that i hit this build specifically cost me over 1 million gold to get yep you're talking all the kudas all the drew wax all that stuff to make this so big shout out to the donors that i'm listing right now Thank you so much for your help. And every viewer out there, thank you so much. I'm going to continue to work on this build. I have a new series coming out called YOLO, One Life, where basically I play one life in Sierra Dell and narrate it and show you kind of what it's like to actually play the build uh, in more in detail. Then I'm going to be doing the Magic Sork PvP build. I'm going to be doing some stuff with the crown crates when those come out as well. So guys, almost at 100K. Once we break that 100K, I'm going to do a big giveaway. So thank you so much for watching. Thank you for supporting me. I uh, couldn't be doing it without you living the dream truthfully.